Um, as, as Michael said, I will talk about both of them, but I want to reassure those of you who are in the room not particularly familiar with modeling or might be have a math allergy that there will be no equations whatsoever in this presentation, all of them are what I'm going to type in here, which is only a fake equation anyway. Um, I will give a bit of an overview about why I'm doing this part, where it comes from, give, give a couple of examples, and then I will talk mostly about different types of models uh, and what, why, as the title suggests, modeling isn't always the same as modeling. So, as my means of introduction, um, as Martin mentioned, I'm a geomorphologist, and that means that I study landscapes. I, I look at forms and processes in the landscape. And traditionally, the, the view is that what geomorphology does is look at particular types of landscapes and tries to explain how do these landscapes arise, why does the landscape look like this, and why don't all rivers look like this, for example. Uh, as, as one thing. Um, or why don't all mountain valleys look like this? This is basically just an excuse for me to stop, show some of my holiday pictures. And actually, I've been to these places. Um, as a geomorphologist, I like going to those places. But I haven't actually literally studied these particular landscapes or so forth. Uh, these are the types of things that geomorphologists would study. How do these big How do these big boulders end up in a river like that, which is a very shallow river? Where do, where do they come from? Where do they end up? Or rather than forms themselves and processes, what well, is a river which is having an enormous amount of traffic around? So what's going on there? So those are the types of things that the geomorphologists study. I am a geomorphologist, I study those types of things as well. But traditionally, a geomorphologist would have looked at something like this. Guy in the field with a notebook observing, looking around what's happening in the landscape and taking notes about that. Typically a bearded person as well, though not necessarily so. Here's another example. These are not old pictures, by the way. These are recent pictures. If you do a search for Google geomorphologist, these are the types of things that have come up. So the traditional view of a geomorphologist still prevails to a very large extent. Um, sometimes they do actual work rather than just observing, but actually busy in a river measuring different sediment movements or something along in the river. And also traditionally, they would have been all male. Uh, that's slowly changing. We, there are more female geomorphologists coming up. But by and large, this is an older picture of a geomorphologist. Uh, this is the father of fluvial geomorphology, Gordon Warren. Um, he's sitting by the riverbank, he's observing the river, he's got his muddy boots on. And he's got his backpack with him, he's got his notebook with him, but he's not actually using it at the moment. But this is sort of the image that geomorphology has of itself, what the geomorphologist should be like. Which contrasts uh, with what a computational geomorphologist does, or somebody like me. This is not me myself, but sitting slouching away behind the desk, <coughs> and coding away into the night, uh, writing programs that eventually will result in some sort of simulation of landscapes, something like this. And this is the type of thing I study, which is remarkably different in concept from those real landscapes out there which traditional geomorphologists study. And it raises questions. Um, there's a large number of people who say, well, this computer modeling that you do, that's not the same as that. You can't learn anything from that, it's not the same thing. So people ask questions, and particularly those old, white, male, bearded geomorphologists, they have issues with this. They say, that's, that's not like geomorphology, that kind of stuff you do. But it is. That's part of my argument for today, is that um, that modeling is some way of learning about the real world, whether it's geomorphology or something else. So, as a geomorphologist, we study the world. And the traditional view is we go out there, we observe, maybe we do some experiments, we take measurements, and we learn about the world. And by those observations, by those measurements, we make some sort of mental image of how that world works. 
que não pode ter isso tudo. Há muitas pessoas que não têm isso. Then you get the computational gym of all this. They do the same thing on the computer. We make some computer code and we represent the virtual world. And we know it's what we do, not, not we create the noise, not exactly, it's not the exact same as the real world, it's some sort of representation, it's simplified. And we do our experiments on the computer. We run simulations, different types of simulations, we do our observations, we see patterns that are forming, we see the types of behavior in the world. And we learn something. In principle, we learn something about the virtual world that we created. But what we say is actually that we are learning something about this real world. And that's the weird step. So the step back to this mental image is not that we make a mental image of this virtual world, is that we make a mental image of the internet to get understanding of the real world. And that's the bit that traditional geomorphologists have trouble with. So they can't do that. But lots of people do. Um, this is um, uh, a graph showing the number of uh, papers in three leading geomorphological journals, Geomorphology, Earth Surface Processes and Landforms, and Journal of Geophysical Research about Earth Processes. The number of publications that refer to simulation of some way or another over time. And it's a bit of a messy graph, but if you take broad trend lines through there, you see that the number of papers that mention simulation as a percentage of the total papers is just <coughs> increasing over time. Except years ago, which seems to have stagnated them. Um, and those papers, they're being read, they're being used. Those that the growing percentage of papers, they're actually, if you the black line is the percentage of papers in each of these different types of geomorphology journal, and the gray line is the percentage of the total size that a, that a journal is generating that are generated by simulation papers. So not only is the number of papers steadily growing, they tend to be overall more cited non-exception, um, than the non-modeling papers, the non-simulation papers. This is for geomorphology. Um, the closest scientific discipline to geomorphology uh, is hydrology, different. and this is for hydrology, there we have a similar thing, uh, but the overall number of simulation papers is far higher in, in hydrology. So we still have a way to go with geomorphology before um, modeling is really uh, accepted to the same level. But they were about simulation papers. I need to mention that. What I mean with simulation modeling. Of course, we can do different types of modeling, as I'll, as I'll show in a second. In simulation modeling, what we look at is some sort of schematized systems approach to understanding the world. And this is my, my schematic representation, where we have a landscape, a part of the landscape that we're interested in, which we represent as a system. And that system, in one, let's say one type of topography, one particular film, is changing over time. So the landscape is changing over time and it eventually becomes a new system. The reason why it's changing is because there are processes acting within that landscape, that are acting on that landscape. And typically the system in geomorphology studies is an open system. There are external influences that affect these processes. Rainfall, temperature, it could be tectonic uplift, it could be volcanism, it could be human actions. There are other external agents or external forces acting on these processes. And as geomorphologists, what we're interested in is how does our landscape at one point in time transform into a different landscape into another point in time? Where is the erosion happening? Where is the deposition happening? Where is the landscape being sculpted and built and how is that, how is that occurring? And that's the reason why many of these geomorphologists go out in the field and look at these things. But sometimes you can't do that. You can't make that step because the processes are either so slow that you would spend several lifetimes trying to just observe them if you wanted to really. Or sometimes they're so fast if you, uh, if you look at a big flow, what's the sediment movement and the erosion in the middle of a big flow? You can't go out in the, during the big flow and stand in the river and measure these things. So sometimes it's just not feasible, sometimes it's impractical, sometimes it's unethical to do the research we want to do. And therefore we can't do it in a traditional way. And well, in those instances, in the small instances as well, we just replace the whole thing by computers. And we now have a computer representation of our landscape, 
which is evolving into a different computer represented landscape through a bunch of simulated processes. Again, with external forces represented in the computer acting on there. And the model in that case is this computer representation of all those processes. The external elements, the initial condition, the initial state of the system are inputs. Then the model acts on that and does things with those input data. And it generates a whole bunch of future states, which are the outputs of the model. And that's process modeling, trying to replicate, simulate those processes. That's different from statistical modeling. So this is a statistical, part of a statistical model. Basically, somebody measured a large, large amount of drainage areas and slopes and plotted them against each other. And you can do some sort of regression, and you can see that for large drainage areas, there's an increase in relation. We go inverse relation, we go back into the smaller ones, and then it sort of levels out. This is statistical. This is not the type of modeling I'm talking about in this, in this uh, presentation. I'm talking about simulation. Here is a similar one. This is a spatial one, a GIS one. People have done some a uh, lot of observation and measurements about um, solar friction processes in landscapes. And they try to observe, okay, wherever I see solar friction, what is the landscape like? What are the slopes like? How far away am I from a river? How far away am I from the top of the mountain in the dark, etc.? And the similar for um, occurrence of particular features, uh, glacial features, fast oh, sunset, very glacial features. And then once they found the relationship, they put it into a GIS and they started looking for all the places around the landscape which have those combinations of slope, distance from the river, uh, different soil thicknesses, etc. And then they map probabilities of finding soil friction processes or probabilities of finding concepts. Again, the type of statistical modeling this time in the GIS. Source model I'm looking at. The process <coughs> represent processes. This doesn't, this doesn't tell us how these features occur. What I am looking at is models where the processes which we observe in the real world are being mimicked within, um, within the model. So in my model, I have a virtual uh, topography, which is indicated here by these cells in different locations. There might be water in there, and the water is moving in the various directions down the slope. That's what water does. So if I have an equation in there that tries to mimic the behavior of water in a downstream direction. As the water moves, it can pick up sediment, it can move that sediment, it can deposit somewhere else. As it's picking up sediment or depositing things, those topographies start changing. I get a new landscape with slightly different topographies, and I start over again. It does the whole thing over and over. So I'm trying to actually simulate the actual processes. And what I get is maps of Erosion and deposition in a particular landscape. This one is in Spain. Um, in this case, red is erosion, blue is deposition. And if I take some cross sections, I can see how the river valley has changed. In this case, the river valley, basically the river valley filled up and the rivers eventually shifted uh, towards the left and on, at the top end of that ridge. So, this is the type of thing that I get out of my models in this particular case. Um, there's more things that we can do with these models, and I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, and in this case, I'm opening, like I said, I will focus on geomorphology, but the talk and the, the ideas that I will talk about later about the modeling specifically, they are transferable, they are generic, and will apply to all sorts of non geomorphology. But within geomorphology, this essentially is a representation of more or less the oldest geomorphological model. This is from 1967. There is some sort of it's sort of a hybrid between a statistical and a process model, but the idea is that we can mimic some way that the rainfall, soil splash, and different processes occurring in the landscape, with gully and will erosion, sediment transport, scouring of the river bed, and we get an idea of how much sediment the river is carrying. That's this model. It's a simplified model. It did remarkably well in terms of um, here monthly. Uh, sediment yields, suspended sediment concentrations, varying over time. The dotted line is what was simulated, the, the solid line is what was actually recorded in the field. And that model did really well. This is the same thing from daily variations. So that, that schematic model, which was in the previous one, when coded up and then running, could actually mimic reasonably well, very well, the uh, 
suspended settlement loads in a river and could potentially be used for predicting future settlement loads in the same river um, at a later point in time. But there wasn't much spatial about it. So just this is what's, what's happening in the catchment, and we measured um, the, the sediment concentrations. One of the first attempts at a spatial model was a couple of years later, 1971, and this is just a cross section of a hill slope, so a high end, down to the lower end. And one, if there was one process acting on the hill slope, there was the process here with soil creep, for those of you familiar with soil creep, you know what I'm talking about, otherwise it doesn't matter. But this is how the hill slope would evolve over time if the only thing which was acting on that hill slope was soil creep. And basically what it's saying is that you would get some sort of flattening at the top <coughs> over time, and as that happens, the later on, the lower parts of the, of the slope will also start bending and going down a little bit in elevation. Um, so this is based on, oh, I was wrong there, actually, there's an equation in here, sorry about that. Um, on, this is based on one equation, uh, the fusion equation of soil creep <coughs> the slope. A couple of years later, 76, we get the same idea, but happening in 2D, pseudo 3D, where we have a landscape, an initial artificial landscape, just like we had an artificial slope in the previous one. It's an idealized landscape, there's some sort of river network in there. A couple of equations, again, for creep uh, and for the river moving sediment out. And that landscape evolves over time, in this case, 20,000 iterations and it slowly generates a new type of landscape, a new morphology. So what you're getting now is a history of geomorphological modeling. Um, fast forward 15 years later, not much has changed except that now our idealized landscape is not this flat, and the river network itself is actually developing, it's building in, eroding into that flat, idealized initial landscape. Six years later, we could do the same thing in color. In a slightly higher resolution, it's basically the same thing. The landscape's evolving. It doesn't have to be hill slopes and fluvial systems. You can also have models that look at formation of dunes, in uh, Aeolian dunes, so like in the desert with low, with low dunes. Um, the next one is a simulation uh, very recently, uh, 2013. This is the development of ripples and dunes on the riverbed. So if you have sand in the riverbed and the river is flowing over, eventually it will start making sort of dune-like patterns which slowly move downstream over the riverbed. But the nice thing is the first people coding this, they didn't say, they didn't tell the model to create dune, dunes. So dunes appear from within the model, but what they told the model is simulate the movement of flow. And if the flow is powerful enough, take out some sediment and move that sediment and adjust your topography accordingly. If the flow is not powerful enough, drop some sediment down. <coughs> and these things emerge from that. So you have a couple of simple equations, simple rules, and you get the, the larger scale features appearing out of it. So at no point did the model say, thou shalt create dunes. But it does. It's kind of nice. Um, here's another one, simulation of how over a period of about 300 years, from an initially straight river channel, idealized, how you get meandering rivers appearing. You can see how the river is meanders on moving, migrating, sometimes you get channel cut-offs. Um, in green you see when uh, the flood plain was last inundated at those locations, how the channel is, how the landscape around the channel is consistently changing, continuously changing. So that's a nice simulation by uh, Andrew Nicholas. All the previous ones were from idealized scenarios. We had an idealized hill slope, idealized catchment, idealized straight river. But we can also do simulations on real in this case, uh, real events. This was a, a massive landslide um, in uh, Washington State a couple of years ago, 2014. Um, it was a badly landslide as well. 43 or 44 people died in the event. Um, you can see here is a couple of houses. There were 47 houses in that area as well. 47 houses were damaged in the landslide. Um, not surprisingly, people wanted to know what happened, how, how did this occur. So the United States Geological Survey 
regards on simulations and started to explore how did this happen? What, what actually what triggered this landslide? And this is a simulation that's going on now for representing the 200 seconds, so it's about four minutes. All of this landslide, the whole mobilization happened within the first 90 seconds. After that, it was just spreading out slowly a little bit. There's a little bit of logistics on the sides, but the bulk of the landslide just happened in 90 seconds. Uh, at least that's what the simulations indicate would have happened. Good. So, quick overview of geomorphology, of modeling and geomorphology. <laughs> now, my question for you guys is what do I use a model for? Why would I want to model? Suggestions? Why would I want to model? To predict. To predict? Mm -hmm. To tell about That's one reason as well, because the insights that lies behind it, the one of this. The most common <coughs> answer is predict, which indeed is one of the main reasons why people want to model. But for academics, there are more reasons. Understand. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, Epstein in the paper in 2008 came about with about 16 different things. You want to model because you want to understand, because you want to predict, definitely, because you want to look at the, the possible outcomes under um, or the range of possible outcomes. Um, you want to maybe get ideas or where where you want to guide future data collection. Model can inspire you to say, okay, these are the places of interest, this is where you should be looking. And there are many, many, many other reasons um, to look at. Where are the uncertainties in the system that I'm studying? Model can help with all of these types of questions. This is a large amount of things. You can synthesize this, I think, in essentially all of those things. They fit in one of three categories. You can be modeled because you want to predict what will happen, because you want to explain something that has happened, or you want to explore the, the range of behaviors that are possible in the system that we're looking at. Note that none of these things mention geomorphology. This is generic for all process-based modeling. There's nothing about geomorphology in here. So predicted modeling, if I go back to my schematic version of the model, is where you have a situation, if we know the initial state at some point in time, an initial state of the system, starting point, and if we know what all the processes are, and if we can capture those processes in a nice algorithm, and if we know what the external forces on the system are, then we can put all that together, and we can look at making predictions of the future, the future state in time. Did you notice I mentioned the word if about four times in that sentence there? There are a lot of ifs about this, but that's what predictive modeling does. If you are confident on all your inputs and in the model, then you can make a prediction about what the future state of the system will be. And you can make very specific predictions in that way. The most common example of that is weather forecasting. This is taken yesterday for Coventry. This is a prediction for the coming week. And weather forecasters make they do those types of predictions. And we have here, from starting at yesterday, we have seven future states of the system, and we have predictions about what the weather is going to be like in each of those states. Good day for modeling on Wednesday. Good day for modeling on Wednesday, and a very nice weekend coming up as well. <laughs> very good. So it was actually a nice. Uh... Here's a more geomorphic one. Uh, this was a study which was uh, looked at some two different predictions. Um, one, if they look at the river system and don't change anything, where will the erosion be happening? And one, if what happens if you put some erosion uh, mitigation measures in, because they are particularly, um, this is the one that is no, uh, if you don't do anything, flows coming in from the right. And for some reason, the people in this case were very concerned about erosion in this area. So they wanted to put erosion mitigation measures in along these lines, and they made it different simulation, a new prediction. If we put these measures in, what will the erosion be like? And basically, that, according to that model, it's no longer eroding. We have negative erosion, which basically means building up the position of the landscape. This is a particular catchment, uh, experimental catchment in um, Taiwan, I think. But we get heavier. These are two different predictions. We can learn something about what type of action we might want to take with that river. 
a different type of modeling, this exploratory, uh, explanatory modeling. And it's fundamentally different. And this is, this is one of the things that actually maybe the, the main point I want to get across in this, in this presentation, in this seminar, that these modes of modeling are fundamentally different. So if you use a model for prediction, you're doing something which is completely different than if you are using potentially the same model or another model for explanatory modeling. In explanatory modeling, you're not interested in this final state. The assumption is actually that we know what the final state is and we're trying to explain how we got there. And what we might, for example, not know what the external forces on the system were. So we had a landscape in the past. We kind of know what it looks like at the end of the glacial uh, period. The glaciers retreat. We know what the landscape looks like. We have a landscape now. We don't quite know how we got from one to the other, what happened in between, which were the dominant forces acting on there. So we make a model, we run the model, we still run it in the forward direction, but we run it with an initial landscape, with our representation of the various processes that capture the evolution of the landscape, and we see which set of external conditions, external forces, give us our observed current landscape. And that typically means that you run the model multiple times, each time with a different set of external <coughs> processes that we put in there, external forces that we put in there, and hopefully one of them will actually result in a landscape which, which looks like the current one. The other ones will, look at, will, will also generate landscapes, but they might not look at all like our current landscape. So what we're doing is fundamentally different. We're not running one simulation like in a prediction where we put all the inputs in, run a simulation, we get an output, and that's our prediction. We are running a whole range of simulations, all with the same initial condition, all with the same model formulation, but with different external processes, and see if everything matches an observed final state. We could do this not just only for the external processes, maybe it's the initial topography that we, that we don't know. We're interested in finding out what did the landscape look like 5,000 years ago. We have maybe an idea of the climate and the uh, variation. Over those 5,000 years, this might give us an idea. Different types of inputs landscapes, which ones result in the final landscape. We don't want to think about geomorphological modeling, if you want to do it in your discipline, just change geomorphology for whatever state of your system. Or we could look at the processes. Maybe we don't have a good idea of how exactly the dominance of the processes themselves relate to each other. Um, maybe we should put more emphasis on hillstone processes versus fluvial processes or erodial processes in this system because, and how these processes interact. That's part of describing the model and maybe that's something we have to play around with. All of these unexplanatory models, but in all <coughs> these scenarios, we're running multiple, multiple, multiple simulations, hoping that, well, assuming that eventually one of them will lead to a final configuration which is similar to what we've observed. That's what, they were, that's what basically the USGS was doing here. They were trying to understand from which parameters in the landscape, which what the soil moisture conditions were that would give to a rapid, that would give rise to a rapid landslide, like a mudslide almost. Um, what were the other conditions? What were the um, the forcing conditions on there? So they didn't run just one simulation. They ran a whole range of simulations, and they saw which of the simulations that they came out with mapped best onto the observed landslide. So they tried the different soil moisture, initial soil moisture conditions. They tried with different soil strengths. Uh, they probably tried with um, different densities of the soil material in there as well. And they came up with that this particular solution was the best one. So that's, a, that's the second one, explanatory model. Third one, exploratory modeling. That's different still. We again try with a whole range of, for example, a whole range of forcing conditions. But we're not trying to generate a particular outcome. We use this type of modeling to look at a range of outcomes. Each of these states produces a range of or produces an outcome, and we can look at the entire range of outcomes. And now we're looking at certain behaviors, general patterns that prevail. Are there any thresholds in that system? If you run with a whole range of different um, external forces, is there a point where suddenly we get a whole different dynamic? in our final topography, or our final landscape, compared to the initial ones, or compared to the other one. So are there overarching trends, behaviors, 
are what you call thresholds. That's the kind of thing you want to get out of exploratory modeling. And this is a type of modeling you typically do when you don't fully understand the system that you're trying to model. Predictive modeling is something that you typically do when you do understand the model because you've just created an algorithm and you have high confidence that this algorithm is actually representative of the real dynamics in your system. You can do the same things for behavior in response to initial topographies or for different representations of processes. So as an overview, this is basically what I've just been talking about. One side predictive modeling. You use this to make specific predictions at a specific point, specific space, in time. At a particular time. Explanatory and exploratory modeling, you don't use to make specific predictions. They're different. The types of questions and the types of insight that you generate with those is fundamentally different. You get an insight in the dynamics, in the nature of the system that you're simulating. Not in, about, not in a particular state of the system, you get insight in the dynamics and processes in the evolution of the system. And you might consider these types of things sort of engineering models. This is what engineers are interested in. If I put some extra base or erosion measures in, what is it going to do? Run, predict, simulate, make a prediction, look at that. These ones are more of academic interest because they might lead to fundamental insights, understanding of the dynamics of the system. They still make some sort of predictions, but they are sort of broader predictions. They're looking at um, magnitudes of change. If I were to increase a particular variable, if I change my external forcing, what type of change am I observing? What direction of change do I observe between different simulations? Um, so I think this is fundamentally important to realize that modeling is not modeling. That's my title equation on there, my title slide. What you do here and what you can learn from these models is fundamentally different. So if somebody is talking about modeling, and they're, they're doing some sort of modeling, it's always interesting to know what exactly they mean by that, what, what, where they are heading with their modeling. What's also different is how we trust these models. This, the, the traditional view of how we trust the model is by validating it. And by validating it, we compare it with um, <coughs> observed empirical data. So you run a simulation in the computer, we make a prediction for it. Uh, we start with an initial state, and we compare with the final state from the real world. If they match, very good. The model has just been validated, we trust in the model. That's only one way of getting trust in the model. Like I said, in most cases, but particularly when we do explanatory or exploratory modeling, we don't fully understand the system that we're modeling in the first place, or we may not have the data. One of the reasons we don't understand this is possibly because we don't have data of what exactly is happening in the middle of a flood or in the middle of a tornado or something along those lines. So, one of the other ways of building trust in the model is compared with other simulated data. If the model can replicate other model results from other computer models, maybe it's doing something right. So, we have a little bit of trust in the model. We can compare with our knowledge, our understanding, if the behavior that the system is showing, if the trends that you get out there, or if, the, if I were to increase this charge in my river, I would expect more sediment transport. Is it doing that? Is the it, is it overall behavior realistic? So this is not specific predictions on the budget. This is just raw dynamics. Is it doing those? If it's doing those, I may have some trust in the model. If it's not doing that, the, if the overall behavior seems very odd or weird, Maybe I don't trust the model that much. Um, the last one is quite similar to the first one, except that for the first one, typically we already have the final data. We have some initial data from the past, and we're trying to match our observed final data. But we can make predictions for the future, which don't, for we, which we don't have the data yet. And then we go out into in the future, in a couple of months, in a couple of years' time, and we, we can see if the model was correct. With hindsight. In some ways, that's the strongest building of trust because you're not trying, you're not influenced by what you might want to achieve. Uh, last way of building trust is using good building blocks in your model, using good code, quality code, verified code. You, you, you build on something which you know is reliable. And those types of things uh, I'll go through different building blocks. 
they have different strengths if you're trying to do predictive, explanatory, or exploratory modeling. The direct validation with observed data is something which is really useful and really powerful in building trust in the model which you want to use for prediction. If it can predict observed past events, so if it can retrodict observed past events, it's doing something right. Uh, you can do it on the direct data, you can also use on proxy data or something else if you're in the same system. Comparing with simulated data is maybe useful. These types of things, they're useful as well. I mean, you would hope that the predictive model can do these things, but they're not enough by the, in their own right to rely on that model to actually make predictions and to trust those predictions. Just because it can do the overall behavior, the overall trend, that's not good enough if you want to make a specific engineering prediction. But for explanatory modeling, those types of things are quite good. If you're trying to explain, and you don't quite understand the system, but you're trying to use the model to help us understand the system, if at least before we try to, before we do that, if it can block, um, simulate and mimic some of the broad dynamics of the system, that's quite good. For exploratory modeling, there's a different thing. These pluses and minuses are indicating how relevant this is very subjective. And I think if you were to ask other people, you might get a slightly different feel of that. This is my, my take on these. Um, and you'll see that using good code is one of the trust elements which is just pervasive all the way through. So not only do we have different modes of modeling, predictive, explanatory, exploratory, which have different inferences about what you can learn from these models, we also have different indications about how you trust those models in the first place to learn something from them. And as I mentioned, they have different experimental design and stuff like that as well. Um, one example of what I've been doing with this is looking at the landscape and I'm feeling it's some sort of climate signal where the climate is varying over time and the general assumption is that we will get some sediment moving out so it's, it's rain on my catchment, there's rain falling on this terrain on this landscape and the rain is channelizing, coming into river channels, it's moving sediment around and if I were to measure at the bottom of the catchment how much sediment is coming out, I will get some sort of fluctuation of sediment over time. One common assumption has been that what you get out of there, the sediment, is more or less proportional, reflective of the climate that we put in. So if we have a very wet climate, we will get lots of sediment coming out. If we have a very dry climate, we will get little sediment coming out, etc. So this would be a direct reflection. But that's the question, is that really true? And it's one of the things that we've been studying uh, together with some of my colleagues in different universities. We've been looking into this question, is that really true? And this diagram suggests that it's not. Um, so, is that happening? To what extent does a <coughs> sediment signal at the bottom of the catchment, to what extent does that reflect a climate signal coming in, um, which has been used as a forcing condition for the simulation? Um, if the reflection is very good, then we could use um, the sediment signal to reconstruct past climate. And we, uh, we can, for example, trace the sediment signal uh, in, this, in the lake bed. If all the sediments which are passing out of the catchment, if they sink into the lake, we get an uh, accumulation of sediment layers. So if this relation holds, then we can look at the lake and we can make a very nice reconstruction of the climate signal. Conversely, can we predict future sediment yields from anticipated future climates? If the relation holds, yes. If the relation doesn't hold, uh, not so much. So I've been doing this with something called the Caesar model. Um, and we wanted to keep it simple initially, really simple. So we had a very simple rectangular catchment, which almost looks like a sheet of paper folded in the, in the middle a little bit. We have a very simple valley, two valley slopes on the side coming into it. It's an idealized catchment to a very large extent, this is a large topography. And I put rainfall on there, and I had somewhat constant rainfall. Basically, every day, the first hour of the day, it rained. Uh, at the rate of 30 meters per hour. So it's 30 meters in the first hour of the day, then 23 hours dry, and the next day the same thing, over and over and over again. So it gets the same amount of rainfall per day, every day, at the same time in the day. And what we got was sediment yields varying, fluctuating all over. Um, almost an order of magnitude, essentially. Um, 
And this was a bit of a surprise to us. We didn't expect these types of variations to come up. We had expected that the because we gave it the same amount of rain every day on the same catchment, that we would get the same amount of sediment coming up every day as well. We didn't. So we started looking into more details. So this is daily sediment yield coming up. But now we look at more detail at uh, sediment yield per second, more or less. Um, the blue line is the amount of water coming out. And the amount of water is very regular because the amount of rainfall is the same all the time. But we found that on some days, that same amount of water was transporting a little bit of sediment, and on some days, a lot more. And on some days, we get various cross of sediment coming out. So it's a very cold dynamic. But this is something that emerged from that system. Um, this basically means that our climate signal, which essentially was constant throughout this, every day it was the same amount of rainfall, that climate signal might be hidden in there. And that sediment yield might not be predictable. Which is rather annoying for the paleoscientists to try to reconstruct these things. So when we published this in 2007, the first time in 2010, a bit more, this caused quite a stir. Since, on, since then, I've done some more experiments. Um, so what happens if we have a signal where the rainfall is actually varying, it's not constant all the time, it's varying very large amplitude? Well, if we have a thousand days of rain, so about three years of rain with an idealized long-term variation of the rainfall, and there is some variability in the sediment yield, but you can still pick out the overall trend through here. So basically, high amplitudes or long duration signals might still be detectable, even though there's a lot of noise around it, it might still detect those. Um, this gave rise to a hypothesis that the predictability of sediment dynamics might depend on the spatial variability in the catchment and the temporal variability in the rainfall, such that homogeneous catchment with a very low spatial variability, so relatively flat catchments with not a lot of spatial variability in them, that they would be quite responsive to small or medium level changes in the climate signal. But that if you have a heterogeneous catchment with a high spatial variability, so a lot of topographic variation in there, a lot of um, land cover variation, a lot of soil variation in there, that those sm small medium changes in the climate, the small medium variations in the climate might not be detectable in there. And it's only the really larger ones that you can see coming through in those types of catchments. We could um, if that were the case, basically what I'm saying is you can have a homogeneous catchment and you were to measure correlation between the climate signal and the sediment signal, that you would get high, very high correlation for high wavelengths and amplitudes, and you would get very low um, if uh, the wavelengths are very small, the amplitudes are very small. But in the core, the more heterogeneous catchments, that those lines would shift even further up. So you would you would get the, the high correlation gets really pushed into the core, the mid-level gets pushed up a little bit up there. That was our hypothesis. That's basically a graphic representation of the previous slide. We tested that. Um, I had a, a catchment. This is a topography. And I ran, this is the original topography. I ran a smoothing filter over that catchment just to smooth out the, uh, small topographic variations. Only the large scales remain. And basically, what it showed is yes, we do get that. Uh, we get a little bit of a shift of those correlations from smoothed. Yeah, uh, the more smooth catchment, the more heterogeneous catchment. So we did get that type of behavior. A couple of years ago, I was in, I spent a half year sabbatical in Botswana. And I had a very nice professor opposite me, uh, on the blog, uh, on, in the yoga team, and he put this on his door. So every time I walked out of my office, I was confronted with um, this quote. This is a famous quote amongst others um, from a paper from 1987. And it's right. I don't think there's a single world who would dispute this, uh, this thing. Uh, Bob Sinclair was talking about statistical models that would be the replies to these simulation models that I'm working with. There are a number of limitations to modeling. Like I said, we, get, we can get 
even from a constant input, we can get very nonlinear dynamics. We can get very nonlinear behavior coming out of the model. Here's another example. This is from um, a study on river meandering, and basically starting from a more or less straight, simple channel. We see an evolution. Each of those lines is an evolution of a river bend. And then we move past <coughs> here. We see that the river bends grow, grow, and at some point get to a state where the, the meandering river bends, as they evolve over time, start cutting into each other. And from there on, we get very almost chaos like behavior, mathematical chaos. This nonlinear dynamics. If you work with a model which has nonlinear elements in it, which nearly every model of interest and any system of interest will have, will have nonlinear components. If it's just a simple linear system, it's not, it's quite boring to simulate. But the interesting models will, interesting systems will all have nonlinear elements in it. But it means that if your model is any good, it will also start exhibiting some nonlinear behavior, nonlinear dy uh, dynamics out there. And that imposes some uncertainty in interpreting what you get out of a model. It limits the predictability, because a small change in, in, in the system might give you a completely different output. It also limits the tractability. If you want to reconsider, here's an output, what exactly caused this dynamic to occur, at what point, what triggered exactly, you have to step back, analyze your model in a little more detail, and you may not get the exact same response because of those nonlinear elements. So, nonlinear systems, being model, they have some uncertainty, some limited predictability, and limited tractability. There are other things as well, uh, particularly for geomorphologists. If I want to model, if I want to try and see if my model is any good based on observed data, I can't wait for the next 5,000 years to happen before I can look if, if my prediction, which I make now, in 5,000 years from now is any good. So what I want to do is I want to start from the past, run the simulation forward, and see if the landscape which I come up with and looks any way, shape, or form like the landscape which I have now. But we don't know what the landscape actually looked like 5,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago. And it's actually one of the very interesting things I find about uh, Neolithic paintings is that they made representations of animals that they saw in their environment. They made representations of the people and that they had their handprints, etc. They never made any representations of the, the physical environment itself, where the rivers were, where the, uh, where the mountains were, and things like that. They, there was no conceptualization, no depiction of what they saw outside. So what we have what we have to do to rely on reconstructing what a landscape may have looked like 10,000 years ago, 6,000 years ago, is looking at some relics landscapes, which might give an indication of where or something that may have been in the past, a little bit of a river terrace, which may indicate there was a floor plain there in the past. Um, Column reconstructions, which give us an idea of what the vegetation might have been like at particular points in the past. And people do do this, and this is a group in Sweden of people who are looking at that for a particular landscape, and they actually make nice graphical representations in this case of what the landscape quite likely, to the best of their knowledge, may have looked like. But obviously, that's kind of limited, and the, the ideas of using one of those landscapes as the input for my model, as my starting point, has a lot of uncertainty. My initial topography, if I want to start in the past and build up to the present, my initial conditions, they have to be reconstructed, estimated with a lot of uncertainty. And that uncertainty is then carried forward in the nonlinear dynamics of the model. There's another one, just a spatial variability. Um, looking at, this is a map of um, methods of estimating soil moisture. Soil moisture in the landscape is spatially variable, and we can measure it. But if you need to measure it, a lot of places, and it can be spatially variable over very small ranges, we can't measure everywhere at that, at that resolution. So what we do is we measure a number of points and then try to estimate what's happening in between. Well, these are one method for three different days. This is one method, this is another method, and this is another method for estimating storm moisture. And you'll see that they are different. So if I if I run a spatial model which relies on having an estimate of soil moisture in it as part of the, the setup, the, the initial conditions, I have which of these methods do I pick? If I go for that one, I have something very different than this one. So again, this imposes some uncertainty in spatial heterogeneity. And again, that's All of these things uh, affect predictability, basically saying that there are 
our limits to um, what we can predict. And it's important to realize that this, this is inherent in the systems that we're modeling. It's not a result of uh, lacking technology or model not being complex enough. It's just inherently the limit of the where, where the limitations of the model are. Climate scientists have found a way around this. Feel this is the same way that both of us have showed you before. Predicting to the future becomes more and more difficult as time goes on. And yes, it will be a nice day for all of them, but I'm not sure that I fully trust this prediction for seven days from now. I'm not sure about you guys. I'm probably more trust this bit here. I don't trust that day. It's a good blue sky. <laughs> but beyond that, as we say, after the weekend, because it's a bit more sketchy, and I certainly want to predict, trust the prediction that goes 20 days, a month, two months in ahead. But we have climate models. We do make predictions that go hundreds of years ahead. And we trust those. It's a different type of predicting. These are not making specific predictions about what the weather in Coventry will be like on Thursday, September 14th, 2074. These are predictions about, in this case, global average surface temperature. You can make similar things for average temperature in northern, northwestern Europe over a decade. So these are, we don't make predictions for individual points in time. We look at averages over two decades here, um, over a larger region, and we make those types of predictions. Maybe at some point, geomorphologists need to, to start considering more detail as well, and accepting that you can't make specific predictions about a specific river bend, how far it will move over a strata of a long period of time. But we can make predictions about is this river going to be meandering? Is it going to be a gradient river? What type of things are we doing? So the, this is a conceptual diagram again. If you look at the short term versus the long term, and systems that we have a low understanding versus high understanding, the predictive type of models, they're really only useful for systems where we have a high understanding, typically for the short term. And afterwards, they start fading out. If you're a system where you, don't have, where you only have a low understanding, you can't even do predictive modeling. So when I mentioned on the subtitle, it's like, uh, when are models useful? Some models are useful, and when not? Predictive modeling is not useful here in any of that things. It's only useful in explanatory modeling. Typically, we use over things that we don't quite understand the system very well. We're trying to, we're trying to learn about the system by explaining some of the observed behaviors. Exploratory modeling, you can use all over. Play around with was basically the model was a toy to, to play around with to learn about the dynamics of the system. Again, this has absolutely nothing to do with geomorphology specifically, but this is generic for all types of process based simulation modeling. I think I'll more or less stop wrapping up here. Um, what we can do with the models predictive, explanatory, exploratory. Possible inferences, but we can make predictions. We can't necessarily prove or disprove anything specifically. We can't really explain or generalize. They are, they are bound to their application domain. Explanatory models we can do a bit more with. We can't make specific predictions. We can maybe make predictions about the broad width or dynamics of the system. Um, but we can use them to generate hypotheses about how the system functions. And we can then go out in the field and measure them. Or we can expose uncertainties. Exploratory is a similar idea, but we start exploring the dynamics, exploring those uncertainties. So different models, different applications, different functioning, different methods of design, different way they work. Um, for the future, the future of modeling, at least in the context of geomorphology, what I'd like to do, or what I think the future is, is better coupling of human influences on these processes to change the landscape. At the moment, we've mainly been focusing to geomorphological models on natural processes. Putting human processes, human factors in more explicitly would be one way to progress geomorphological modeling. Looking at impacts and interactions between vegetation and, um, and geomorphological processes would be another one. Looking at the interactions of animals in the geomorphological landscape and their response the landscape is changing, you might have different uh, animals around in the landscape as well. Would be another way. Some people are looking into this burrowing of animals and how that is changing the landscapes. And overall, again, human influence landscapes, changes to land, to uses, 
how are they interacting with the genealogical processes uh, in, in two directions. So those will be different futures. <coughs> and uh, three slides of conclusions. The first conclusion is, and this is a take home message for all of you guys, modeling is not the same as modeling. It really depends on what you're doing with the model. The three fundamental modes, predictive modeling, explanatory modeling, exploratory modeling. I hope I have conveyed to you that these are different. Uh, they have different methodologies, they have different natures of inquiry, they have different things that you can learn from them. They have different ways of assessing whether they are trustworthy or what you want to do with them. And they have different limitations and different possibilities. Second conclusion, we can't simulate everything. We can't predict everything, we can't simulate everything. <laughs> Um, some ideas are the same, numerical modeling and numerical modeling, but they are different. Um, but we can simulate or predict some things. I and mean, if you use the right type of model, I and mean, if you are aware of what you're using it for, are you predicting, explaining, exploring? We can use them um, meaningfully, usefully. Modeling doesn't stand alone, so the traditional bearded male geomorphologists do not have to worry. Their field is safe, and geomorphology will continue to be a field discipline. But modeling can complement what the field geomorphology can teach us. And there are plenty of um, futures around for geomorphologic modeling and for modeling in general. Third conclusion, which maybe for some of you is the most interesting one, is that it's going to be a nice weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.